Welcome back to another installment of Iron Therapy. I'm Dave Palumbo, and I'm joined, as always, by our RX Muscle staff psychotherapist, Leslie Timble. How are you doing? I know you're in the throes of contest prep. You got the Olympia Amateur coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, just, just under four weeks now, Dave. You're in uh, Vegas. You, are you training at the Dragon's Lair over there? I am. Yeah, it's a great gym. I really love the vibe here. Right. Do you ever swap around? Do you ever like, you know, cheat on Dragon's Lair and go to like Iris and the Hides place at all? No. And it's not that I don't want to go to other gyms. At one point I will. It's just, you know, it's Groundhog Day. So I have a schedule of what I do every day and it's the exact <laughs> same thing every single day. Are you actually <laughs> staying near uh, Dragon's Lair? Sorry, am I? What? Are you staying near that gym? Near. I wish I was closer. I ended up getting a condo, but it's about 20, depending on traffic, 20, 25 minutes away. But okay. uh, at least I get to go to a gym. So I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. How close are you to the strip? Oh, I'm really, on, I'm basically on the strip. Oh, you are? Oh, well, that, that's convenient. So. Well, in a way, yes. But in a way, no. You, you probably haven't even walked into a casino yet. I, oh, I haven't. No, I haven't. <laughs> I've walked to my car. That's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> Isn't it pathetic? We got. I've gone to some of the craziest, most beautiful cities in the world, like with bodybuilding shows, and I've seen absolutely nothing in some of them. You know, yep. literally nothing. You know, so <laughs> hey, we're, we're very single-mindedly focused on what we want to see. You know, and what we do. That's for sure. For sure. Yep. I was in. Uh, I went to Germany a couple times, and uh, the first. I think the first time I went there, I don't think I saw anything, you know, but then the second time I went and I saw some stuff and I went to the um, Cologne, Germany zoo. And I went to, uh, they have like a very old um, like church there. And it's funny because I went to this old church and I'm walking around and, and I see like five bodybuilders in there, which was like <laughs> kind of weird because everyone had the same idea I did. Right. It was like bizarre. I, I ran into someone, I don't even remember who it is. I ran into someone I hadn't seen like in 10 years. I'm like, I have to come to Germany to like run into you. And uh, <laughs> I, I, God forbid we pick up the phone and call each other, you know? Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. But anyway, we're going to be talking about sore losers today because hmm. it, it's, I always say it's, it's, everyone's a great winner, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of sore losers out there and people who just, and look, we're all upset. No one wants to lose, but some people handle it more gracefully, more professionally. Some people, just go crazy and they like have to like, you know, vent on social media and, and, and it just usually casts a bad light on them, no matter whether they did get screwed or not. Because if you got screwed, let other people say you got screwed. Don't you go out there and say, I got screwed, you know? Absolutely. And actually there's actually sore winners and sore winners are basically people who there's a difference between celebrating your victory, which is great. I think you should. <laughs> Yeah. Don't rub it into other people's faces. Like you're not going to do a happy dance around them and, and point at them and laugh. Not to say that people do that per se, yeah. especially in bodybuilding, but that's a sore loser. You can celebrate oh, your victory, but be respectful of the people who didn't make it as far as you did. Yeah. I knew a kid, and this is a true story. I'm not going to mention who it is because he'll probably get insulted, but he used to bring his trophy to the gym every day for at least the first like six months after he won his show. And six it wasn't months. like, it wasn't like like the Nationals. It was like, you know, the Mr. Long Island or something like that. Okay. And every day he would bring that trophy to the gym. It was, it was, it was, and I don't know what, <laughs> I guess rather than leave it there, maybe he thought like someone was going to steal it from him. So he would bring it every day with him. And it was, it, people were so sick and tired of seeing that fucking trophy. I, I, I had a couple of friends who wanted to like, you know, like destroy the thing, you know. <laughs> was he using it as motivation just to push himself harder? Or? No, he was, bra was bragging. He was bragging about that he won the show, you know. Yeah, but, that would be a sore winner. Yeah. yeah. That's another That's another show topic. That's but, another show. <laughs> you know, probably the first um, exposure I've had to sore losers in bodybuilding came pretty early in my career. I was uh, at the uh, USA Championships for the very first time. So it was my first pro qualifier I ever competed in. And uh, that was the year that Phil Hernan uh, upset Craig Titus. Mm. I was uh, seventh that year, but I remember seeing everyone backstage and uh, they were announcing the winners and it was came down to Phil versus Craig. And Craig thought it was his turn and he was gonna get the win. And then they announced Phil in first place and Craig went crazy. He threw his, took his number off and threw it at the mm. judges. and. 
went ran backstage and he was like smash he smashed his trophy backstage and he was just going ballistic and i had never seen anything like that like i it, like it, i wouldn't even think to do that you know but i guess he was so frustrated because he really thought he was going to win and mm-hmm. he was off he was not at his best so it wasn't like he got ripped off or anything like that but that was my first exposure to that and that said a lot about craig's character which later down the road obviously you know he wanted we know the story of craig titus he's in jail for murder so is what it is. Well, what's interesting about, you know, when people say, you know, how come some people can lose more graciously than others? It can stem as early as childhood. Mm. Because, you know, in childhood, if we're not corrected right away, you know, as far as trying to be a good sport, mm. not say don't be disappointed. Of course, being right. disappointed. I mean, I don't know a single, anyone who's going to compete, not just in bodybuilding. If you're at a competitive level with any kind of sport, if you're actually happy that you don't win, there's a problem. So it's expected to be disappointed, but it's how you carry yourself after the disappointment. Do you handle with class or do you take it personally and stomp or throw your trophy or whatever? So it's about saying, you know, where do we learn that behavior? And a lot of it can stem, like I said, you know, from, from growing up, because if we're not taught a form of discipline as far as managing our emotions, such as when we lose, yeah. How are we going to be able to apply that in life later on? Yeah. So it can start as early as childhood. And, and, you know, I'll do a separate video later on as far as lack of discipline and where's that all come from and how can we can correct it. I want to talk about more about kind of coaching people, how to lose more graciously. Well, too bad. Uh, Mike Menser didn't get a hold of you back in 1980 because when he lost that uh, Olympia to Arnold, mm. he, you know, a fixed show. It ruined right. his whole life, really, because he allowed it to eat away at him inside. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, it made him like a very bitter person. And it's a shame because Mike was a very smart guy. He knew a lot about training. He was very gifted. And I, I really think it ruined his life, just like I think it ruined Casey Vieter's life when he lost that 81 um, Olympia to uh, Franco Colombo, which was which was probably a fix. And both, probably, I don't know about the Arnold show, but the, the, the Colombo win was definitely a fix and but these guys allowed it to consume them how do you tell people if people are going to come to you uh maybe they lost a show a pro qualifier you know and 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 they're really really upset about it how do you tell how do you walk people through the process of getting number one past that loss so that it doesn't continue to plague them the rest of their life and secondly how to you know just leave the stage gracefully without you know exploding Okay, so leaving the stage without exploding uh, is 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 really important because it's when you're posing. You know how they say, you know, be aware because the judges are watching you all the time, right. including you between your transitions. Yep. So you may not be judged when the show is over, but you're being by the judges per se. But you've got the audience, and you want to show, you know, that you can be a good sportsman. Now, as far as hold, how to hold it together. It's learning how to, to pair the stage with a certain perception of who you are as a, as a bodybuilder. Right. That's not your only identity. So if you do not win, and let, let's be honest, how many shows are we going to win every time? <laughs> it's not going to happen. So you got to learn no. how to lose. Oh. And that's got to be taught well before the show. Now, I'm not saying prep to say you're going to lose. You got you to train like you're going to win. Sure, but, but mentally you have to be able to bounce back if you're and and cope with that loss in a way that's going to be more constructive rather than destructive. And part of that is separating the identity of who you are as a person versus your placing. So if you come in second, which I call second place itis, but I mean if you come in second or lower, of course it, when you're that close, it it does suck, no question about it. But do you use that as fuel or do you have that consume you? Now, is it going to consume you for a little bit? Yeah. I tell people if you need to feel crappy, if you need space from people, take a walk, take a mm. walk cool down, go for a, you know, walk it off, jog it off, whatever you need to do, get it out of your system for a little bit. Cause you have mm. a right to be upset. Right. You have a right to feel upset, but it's mm. how you express it. That's not okay. Like, you know, I wouldn't say go punch a wall. <laughs> okay, that's and not going to work. And you won't be able to work out for six months. And then you're yeah. not going to be able to work out. <laughs> but no. I mean, 
Yeah. One of the things I think people have to understand too is it, let's say you're doing a show and it's very close mm. and the other person gets the win and you get second place. Maybe you get third place. All right. But it was close. Maybe there was some favor involved. Maybe someone owed someone for maybe the, the guy who won got screwed in the last show he did. If you react badly and show poor sportsmanship and people talk about it after the woods, it casts a bad light on you. And then what happens is when the next show you do and it's close and the judges are going to say, you know what, you know, he really should have won the other show. Let's give it to him now. They're going to be like, you know what, fuck this guy, because you know what, we're not going to give him any, any, we're not going to give him the benefit of the doubt. If he's not at a hundred percent, he's not going to win. We're, you know, we're going to pick the, so you're actually screwing yourself because let's face it. Very few bodybuilders do one show and then that's it. You know, you're going to compete again. You have to keep that in your head. Even if you feel like, oh, this was such a horrible process. I can't believe I didn't win. I don't even want to do this again. That feeling will fade after one day. Okay. When you wake up the next morning, you're going to want to compete, you know, again. So don't screw yourself for the rest of your career because you had a bad day or you, you don't like the outcome of what happened because it's not a reflection on you as a person. It's a reflection on other situations that you don't even know were going on. And who cares? Because there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well just smile. You know, people always said, Dave, weren't you upset? They never gave you a pro card. You came in second twice. You came in third a bunch of times. And, you know, did, did it annoy you? And I said, you know what? Maybe the first time it annoyed me a little bit. And then I said, you know what? Everyone's talking about how I should have won the show and I was getting magazine coverage and I'm getting guest posing. I'm like, these guys are making me more popular by not letting me win than, than by winning. So who cares? I'm accomplishing what I need to do, which is I'm making a living in the sport. I have a lot of popularity. And you know what? Eventually, hopefully, you know, I'll get my pro card. Now, I didn't because I stopped competing but uh, because I had injuries. But regardless – I did. I accomplished what I needed to do. If I would have been like an asshole up there and cursing and throwing my number at the judges and smashing things, they would have that would have confirmed whatever they believed about me or whatever. And that would have said the message like, don't hire this guy. Don't work with this guy to other promoters. Don't give this guy a contract because he's a nutcase, you know. And so by smiling through it all, even if I was hurting inside, I projected that I was a winner, regardless of what the judges said. And that defined who I was for the rest of my career. So I think that, you know, you have to understand, take my situation because no one, you know, very, maybe I'm not the worst, but very few people, you know, were as close as I was for so long and didn't get the pro card. And so I understand that feeling, but at the same time, I also understood what the sport was about, that it's a beauty pageant and that there are other opportunities other than winning to make a really good living and to have, you know, be involved in the sport for a long time. And, and that's what always was the, you know, what was hanging around the back of my head. I kept saying, I want to be in the sport for a long time. I want to make my living from it. I like what I'm doing. I don't want to, I don't want to be kicked out of the sport because, because I'm acting like an idiot, you know, even if I think I should have won or everyone else thinks I should have won, it doesn't matter. That's not what it's important. That's not what it's about. And so use me as an example, you know, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. There were, the last loss I took behind Chris Cook won the uh, heavyweight class at the 2002 uh, 2003 USA. He didn't win. He didn't get his pro card because he wasn't really that good in that show. Uh, they gave it to. They were only giving two pro cards out per per for all the divisions at that time. Now it's every weight class gets one, and so he didn't even get one. So I was like, what a waste. I was in crazy shape. I definitely would have gotten a pro card probably because I was shredded and he wasn't. And, you know, and I was, I was so depressed. It was the only time I didn't go out afterwards and go to dinner and, and go out to a, you know, a club or something like that. I just stayed home. Like you said, I isolated myself, but I, I did it on my own. I didn't go around bitching and complaining to everyone about how I got screwed. I just, just sucked it up. And it was a little depressing because I had been second to the, the year before and I thought this was going to be my time. And, um, you know, and Chris Cook was being filmed for some documentary backstage. So I, I felt like maybe he was getting favor because of that. And, you know, it is what it is. You know, it, it, it didn't it didn't really matter. And it probably helped me anyway long term because, like I said, it, it forced me to to reconsider what I wanted to do. And I kind of retired after that. I competed one more year and then I retired because I said, you know what, my, my, my shoulders are hurting too much. I'm going to wind up damaging my health. And so. 
everything happens for a reason. Sometimes you have to just realize what the reason is at the time, even if it seems like there's absurdly no reason why you shouldn't have won. That's the best I could explain to people from my perspective. Well, I was just about to say is to keep perspective is the other thing I tell people to do, which is what you're saying is, you know, yes, we want to win, but you know, why, are, why are you competing in the first place? Right. You know, it's trying to say, you know, what's your goal? Is it to make a living out of, you know, bodybuilding? Is it to kind of test to see how far you can take your body? Do you want to be a role model for people? Do you want to inspire people? Like what is your why and get back to that because you can get to your why in more ways than one. It's not just winning. And as you know, it, it takes a long time to build up a good reputation and it takes literally milliseconds to destroy it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's to keep that in mind is that I'm not saying pretend to be someone you're not. It's just be composed, be classy, you know, about it. And, you know, it's good to be able to take some time away from everybody, but I wouldn't do it for too long a period of time because then your mind can go down the rabbit hole. You know, if I would say maybe up to a week, up to a week, I wouldn't even say necessarily longer than that. Mm. And then if, and then reach out to people because right. what happens is your, your, your thoughts can go down I call it the rabbit hole and you might have what are called exaggerated thoughts or untrue thoughts such as, Oh, I'll never be able to do well in bodybuilding or I'm no one's proud of me. Or like we get these, these really, th these negative thoughts that are based on insecurities and sometimes we need that validation to say, no, what, there's a lot of people out there that are very proud of you and yeah. that you inspire people, whether you know it or not. And sometimes we need that reminder, but we need that reminder through talking to other people. And that's why it's important to reach out after a period of time. Now, initially, it might be just your family, your friends, might be your coach. And then maybe later on, it's it, with, you know, some of your fans. Yeah. But, you know, it is about reaching out or a professional support if you need, like myself. But it's being able to reach out at some point, because if you're not able to dial yourself back or bring yourself back on your own, it doesn't hurt to ask for help. It's hard to do, but it, it, it's actually more beneficial and it'll speed up your process for being able to bounce back if you're able to do that. Yeah. You know, Tony Freeman uh, had a great thing he used to say whenever he would do the press conferences at the Olympia or, or anyone interviewed him. He'd always be like, just put me next to these guys. Yeah, he just wanted to be compared, you know? And if he wasn't compared at a show, he never bitched and complained at the show. He might do an interview after and say, I wish I could have stood next to these guys. And I remember, I think it was the 08 Olympia. I was doing his prep. You know, we had been working together for a bunch of years and, and he really nailed it. That was like his best ever. Like he was just on. And that was the year that Jay Cutler was off. And we knew he wasn't going to win. And it was just a matter of who in that top five was going to win. And the judges wound up giving it to Dexter that year. And Dexter was probably the, the most shredded guy up on the stage, which he always was. But Freeman was so beautiful, his physique. I mean, because he, he was so much bigger than Dexter and he had everything flowed and he was, he was shredded and he was, he had just put it all together for that, that one show. And, and I thought, you know, and I was sitting with people in the audience and we all said, Freeman should win this show because Jay is off, you know, Jay at his best, you know, usually took out Freeman just because he had better legs. But um, I just thought that was going to be Tony's show. And, you know, he was really upset after that. It, but you know what? The accolades he got from his peers, you know, about, hey, you, this was the, you know, because Tony had never placed top five at the Olympia. They're like, you know, you're top five, but you, I mean, you should have won. He loved hearing that. And that was enough for him not yeah. to like go and bitch and complain because he knew how it, the process worked. You know, it was hard to kind of move from out of the top five to win the Olympia. It just didn't, didn't happen like that. And, you know, he took it gracefully, but I know deep down, he probably to this day, if we had him here right now, he'd be telling you, man, that hurt, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> that's at the highest levels yeah, you know? yeah. Talk to, let's talk to victor martinez you know also victor martinez mm -hmm. uh I think it would, would olympia was it 07 i think it was he you know he should have won or i think it was 07 he should have he should have beat jay cutler that year he was just that was you know that was his year and he they gave it to jay and he was really messed up in that but he, victor was never never ever ever a, a sore loser I, he probably took lost better than anyone I've seen, you know, and he, that was his show. So, you know, Nasser was another guy who was bitter. You know, he, he was a bad loser. He didn't, he wouldn't complain on stage or anything like that, but he would complain, you know, anytime you talk to him after that, <laughs> but that's okay. As long as you're not a sore loser on stage, because that's, 
the last image that people have of you in their mind, you know. But then when you walk off stage, David, it is important, like I said, get space if you need it. Sure. But then at some point, at the days after the show, it is important to kind of process what took place and take accountability. So even if you thought you got ripped off and you felt the judges were being unfair, um, and they're not, and be, be aware that that's not always the case. They yeah. try to be as fair as possible. And the way this scoring system works is that they throw at the top and the bottom but score. But I mean, apart from that, take accountability, say, okay, what can I learn from this? What can I do better? So I will be unmistakably higher than that person. Or I'll be unmistakably number one. And then have a, a, not just say, okay, if I have to bring up my legs, that's not good enough. What is your plan? What's your action plan? What's your strategy on what you're going to do to get there? So have short-term goals on how to get there and keep accountable because then you can be more focused on what we call being growth minded versus being process minded. So process minded is I have to win. Yes, we want to win. Everyone wants to win. But as far as you, you know, even the, the greatest of all time, they're not going to win every single time. So to say, how do you bounce back is being able to say, how do I have that growth mindset to saying, what do I learn from this? What can I execute now? What can I execute today, tomorrow, the next week? What are my goal posts so I can keep engaged in the process rather than focusing on the past? We can't change the past. We can only focus on the now and moving forward. So with the growth mindset, you're in the present and moving forward towards goals versus getting caught up in that, what I call that, that, that going down the rabbit hole, because that doesn't help. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have to just put it all into perspective. You know, bodybuilding is a tough because it really is, I mean, a beauty pageant. I mean, with, I feel bad for like boxers. Like if you ever see like a boxing match where it goes to the decision, you know, and they have to make yeah. a decision and, and it's just a terrible decision. Like every, everyone knows the guy, one guy should have won and the other guy somehow wins, you know, because when you leave it into the scorecards and there's no definitive end to the fight where someone gets knocked on the ground, you know, it becomes, it's almost like, it becomes like a bodybuilding show. It's like you're leaving it in the judge's hands at that point. Now, you would think that the judges would pick the right person, but it doesn't always happen. You know, so I can, a lot of these guys go crazy, you know, when they, if they, if they don't want to fight, you know, when they know that they, they deserved it, especially when you get in your head pummeled all fight and then you, and then you wind up, you know, not winning. I can understand how people could be a lot more upset, but bodybuilding is really a beauty pageant. So you almost can't take it personally because you're not doing any battle. It's not like I'm lifting weights on stage against someone. I'm not running against someone. I'm not, I'm, I'm showing how beautiful my body is, is what I'm doing on stage. And, you know, everyone's definition of beauty is different, you know, and there's different things that go into this marketing aspects of it. And we don't even know what goes on behind the scenes truly when a decision is made. So the only way you can definitively really win a bodybuilding show is to be far and above better than everyone else. Once it's close, you know, it's it's a flip of a coin, and and it's, it comes down to what the guys judging you or women judging you think is beautiful in their mind, and that's really what it amounts to. You know, you think the, the Miss America pageant, for instance, they're not even being yeah, they get a talent thing a competition. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's a beauty pageant, right? I mean, so the, you can justify almost anyone winning because all those women up there are gorgeous, right? Mm -hmm. So. It, it's very difficult. You know, you, you cannot take these things personally. Like, I think what happens, Leslie, is people maybe don't feel worthy inside themselves. And then when they're that, that, that becomes validated that they're not worthy in their mind that they lost the, the, the competition after giving everything they possibly can give. It like almost like brings back like a childhood memory, like where their father said, you're, you're a piece of shit or your mo their mother said, you'll never amount to anything. And I think they snap. That's really what I believe. Well, it Why could be a, a trigger for some people. I do disagree as far as bodybuilding being just a pageant. I will. We can talk about that later. I do think it's a sport, but that I know that's a debate. I'm talking about when it gets to the level where everyone is so good, you know. Well, look at the Olympia. Are they going to go? Not as you know. I mean, when when you see all these podcasts, rate your top five, assuming everyone's at their best. <laughs> You might as well, you know, hope for world peace because when does everyone show up their best? You, <laughs> right. you know, it's just, we want to show up their best, no question. But there's always something that goes wrong and that's why it's so hard to predict who's going to be your top five, let alone the top 10 this year. Right. But, you know, and again, do they go for, do they go for like mass? 
Do they go for shape? Now in the ideal world, you want both and the conditioning, obviously, you know, those deep lines, but they can take it personally to say, Hey, they're going for size. Let's say based on someone who has a great shape, right? You know, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's easy to take things personally because they have so much invested in it. It may not even be, it could be a trigger for, from their childhood for sure. But sometimes it's like when you put everything, you're literally sleeping, eating, training, bodybuilding. And like, like I said, for the Olympia, how can you not take that personally to some degree, to some degree? Yeah. But I think some people take it so personally because it, 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 it basically pushes at a deep wound that they have inside of them that they've been Whole, not dealing with probably for their whole life. It can. And now all of a sudden yeah. they've been validated. They've been exposed for not being worthy, even though they believed that all along that they weren't worthy. And now all of a sudden, I'm not saying this is the case with everyone, but I think a lot right. of times yeah. when people explode on stage, it's because they have something inside them that, that just makes them like all of a sudden these judges have validated everything they were trying to like disprove about themselves. And so it becomes something more than it really should. You know, whereas for most people, all right, I lose. It sucks. I'm pissed off. Yeah. What a, those judges suck. You know, you could say whatever you want in your mind, but you don't really act on it because you're like, all right, well, I, I get to eat like McDonald's or I get to go eat like a nice dinner now and stuff my face with food and, and I got a party to go to after. And so it's not the end of the world for most people, but for some people, it, it really is a, a deep emotional wound, I think. Mm hmm. And those people, if that's the case, you know, that's, I think, when someone should reach out to someone like you, Leslie, and, and, and have a talk with them, because you got to work that out, you know, because that really shouldn't be a part of the process of why you're competing and, and, and how you value yourself. If I don't win, I, I'm a piece of shit, unless right. I, win, you know, because that's no way to live. It's not. And then it puts you in a, in a disadvantage when you're getting ready, let's say for shows next year, even if you're at the point where you feel so shitty about yourself, you're like, I'm never going to compete again. To your point, give it a little bit more time. That could change. Yeah. Not for, for maybe 90% of the people that will change. There might be that 10%. It doesn't because it hits them so hard, yeah. you know, for whatever reasons, but you know, for the 90% that say, okay, I want to compete again their bounce back is going to take a lot longer if they don't learn how to, to be able yeah. to take, you know, I call it, take, you know, the lemons and make it lemonade again, action strategies on how you can be better next time. It's not just train harder. It's not just, you know, maybe diet longer. There's a mm -hmm. bunch of stuff that needs to happen up here. So for people after, especially after the Olympia, they do need to reach out to mental game coaches to make sure they're ready for next year because there can only be one winner. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I wanted to talk about that. Maybe we could do a separate show on coaches because, you know, I was talking to my friend uh, Dom Matasio the other night and he, you know, he was working with Nick Walker and, and um, then Nick, you know, at the last minute for this Olympia, you know, changed back to Matt Jensen. And, and you know, you're saying at, at the level that some of these guys are at, at the Olympia level, we were saying that a lot of times you're, the coaches are more of like a psychologist <laughs> than actually someone who's telling these guys what to eat and, and, and how much cardio to do because – yeah. These guys have so much pressure on them because they're at such a high level of competing that they really just want a moral support system. And that's why I don't I don't know why guys at that level don't have a, a sports psychologist like you that they can talk to on a regular basis when they feel doubt or they feel, you know, stressed out or or they're, you know, there's it starts to pile up because they have pressure on them. They you shouldn't be using your coach for that. Your coach should be the guy who advises you on what how to train and eat and all that other great stuff. You should have someone like Leslie, and it doesn't have to be you, obviously, but right. someone like you who understands, who can, who's dispassionate to the process and is going to listen to the person and walk them through all the steps to not go down that dangerous path of, of you know, sabotaging yourself. Absolutely. I mean, I think I've mentioned this to you before. Tom Brady has how many coaches? It's not because he doesn't know what he's doing. He just wants to be the best. If you want to right. be the best, you want to make sure you cross all your T's and dot yeah. all your I's. Yeah. And you have a specialist in all these categories to be able to help you do that. Bodybuilder should be. Yeah. There was a guy, Pete Siegel. Um, he was a sports hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. And everyone knew Pete back in the Gold's Gym Venice days. He used to train at the gym there. And he would... He worked with a lot of top athletes, a lot of top bodybuilders. I, I've interviewed him multiple times. He's he unfortunately he's no longer with us. He passed, but 
he was working a lot with Victor Martinez when he was at the top of his, of his game. And he was doing hypnosis with him and just talking him through things and helping him to stay focused and stay away from the negative in his mind. And, and Victor loved it. Victor said he, he really helped him a lot. So I can only imagine, you know, if Victor, who was, you know, the most laid back person you've ever met, doesn't get stressed out about anything. If he needed someone like that, I have to believe that every guy in the top 10 needs someone like that or someone who's going to be able to have, be there for them to, walk them through the, the mental process of staying in a positive state of mind. Especially as you get closer to the show. Yeah. Because our mind doesn't, doesn't, you know, it's off season and then in prep. And as you get closer to the show, the pressures, you know, obviously of the show and wanting to do well, mm -hmm. but it's also social media. And we all know the influence of social mm -hmm. media and the it's another whole show. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of, you know, can really mess up people's brains. And sure. if, if you're not in the right headspace, that can affect your training. And then obviously sure. your cortisol level. So, I mean, it has this mm -hmm. ripple effect. So, yeah, it's really important for people really, you know, I keep saying on my channel, you know, to keep your mental game on. It's really important to be on it. Mm -hmm. It's just as important as eating and training. But, you know, right. bodybuilders need to learn that if they don't tap into that, they're not going to tap into their full potential. Mm -hmm. Very wise words. And guys, if you're uh, watching this and you feel like, you know what, this is your, it's resonating with you. This information seems like it's something that is, is going to be helpful to you. You can reach out to Leslie at any time. Leslie, give you contact information. Yeah. So basically, you know, send me a text at 416-805-6155 or DM me on my Instagram at Leslie T underscore mental underscore iron. You should do like, uh, do you have like yearly packages for people who need you like on a, <laughs> on a regular basis? Do you give like discounts? Like if they sign up for multiple. Packages? I could do that. Yeah. If someone oh, wants to do that. So more. Do that on, a, on, a, on, a, on a permanent basis, I think. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us again today. And uh, if you have any uh, suggestions for future show topics, put them in the comments below. For t now, I am Dave Palumbo with Leslie Timble. Leslie will be on her. Uh, oh, you're not going to be. We're not doing this live. So. But you can check out Leslie Timble's YouTube channel. She's got some great content on there, content on there as well. Uh, for now, we are out of time. See you again next week.